that's the song. Hey, it's me, John Park. I'm here for another episode of John Park's Workshop, and hopefully you are too. Uh, thanks for stopping by live, live streaming. Uh, we've got people over in our Discord that I'd love to uh, say hello to. Hello, people in our Discord. Uh, Thin Man, Todd Bot, Split City DIY, Johnny Bergdahl, hello and welcome, and thanks for stopping by. Uh, and thank you for stopping by over in the YouTube chat, if that's where you are. Uh, if you're somewhere else, like Twitch, and you're wondering where the chat is, head on over to our Discord. It's at adafru.it slash Discord. Look for the live broadcast chat channel, and that's where it's happening. Uh, let's see, what else is going on today? I've got some fun stuff to show you. Some progress on the sci-fi computer perfection ambient synth thing. Uh, so that's happening. I want to show you some of that, some of the wiring and some updates, a uh, few updates in coding and more to come, uh, especially as SynthIO continues to progress. So thanks to uh, Mark and Jepler, Mark Gambler and Jepler, who are doing great work on some of the cool features in SynthIO. I've also got a coupon code for you. I have a product pick of the week recap. And I have a CircuitPython Parsec to show you. And uh, I've got a little bit of a gear report slash teaser for a future project that I wanted to show. Uh, hey, Dave Odessa, just showed up over in the YouTube chat. Welcome. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, well, let's see. First thing I want to mention is the coupon code. It's space orb. Space dash orb. If you type that in, in the coupon code slot right over here at adafruit.com when you're checking out, that will get you 10% off of your order. So head on over to Adafruit. Uh, check out some of the cool stuff we've got. Look in the products view all next to new products. That'll show you the latest cool stuff. Uh, we've got a few of those chalk key switches in stock, uh, breakouts for the key switches. We've got the new ANO rotary encoder uh, board, which is an I2C Stemma QT version of that, which is super cool. Uh, and a few other new things, as well as some of the great old things. So if you want to buy some stuff, head to Adafruit.com, throw things in your cart on the way out. Type that right there in Space Orb. That's going to get you 10% off. That's good on all physical things, not on software, not on gift certificates, not on subscriptions, but yes, on everything else, which amounts to thousands of items we have in stock. I don't know exactly how many we have. I think, is there a, is there a counter at the bottom? I can't remember. Um, I think I'm thinking of Learn Guides, but we're in the thousands. Some of these product IDs are like 5,000 something. That doesn't mean all of the past stuff is in stock. Some things get discoed or discontinued. Uh, but 
I'm sure there's some stuff there that you might like. So head on over there and you can use that coupon code to get 10% off, which helps. Uh, all right, so product pick of the week show. That's the logo right there. Show happens on Tuesdays. That's what this week's episode looks like right there. That's the product pick. Uh, and here's a little recap. It is the Feather RP2040 with DVI for HDMI video output. An HDMI port uh, that can be used to send DVI video out to your HDMI or DVI monitor. Feather RP2040 DVI. It is running CircuitPython code. This is a really lovely demo that Toddbot created. One of the screensaver demos that Phil B created. This is the, uh, the Max Headroom one. A variation on some Toddbot video synth demos. Uh, I've got sliders to control things like the size and horizontal position of a triangle. As I move it, it's doing a nice little uh, sort of fade effect. And I can also change the colors on that and set it rotating uh, with a, let me set that to a nice slow speed. Oh yeah, look at that. It is the Feather RP2040 DVI with HDMI video output. All right, uh, that was that. And then uh, the next thing I want to do is jump into a circuit Python parsec. Um, before I'll do that, I'll say if you've got some suggestions on things you'd like to see in circuit Python parsec, some topics I haven't covered before, uh, either just in pure code stuff. Uh, like today's is going to be, or uh, using some specific sensors or uh, outputs, inputs, and things, microcontrollers, displays in CircuitPython, let me know, and I will put that on the list for upcoming episodes. Uh, but for today, we've got this. All right, here we go. Uh, so for today's Circuit Python Parsec, I wanted to show you how you can use the enumerate command in order to get a list of items and their index numbers or indices. Uh, so here you can see in the code I have importing time and OS, and that's because I'm going to grab a list of files that are on this Feather RP2040 right here. Uh, I'm going to call that list the song files list. And then I'm going to go ahead and use this command right here for index comma file in enumerate song files. That is going to create two variables. One is going to be the index and one is going to be the name. And those come from this enumerate command, which is going to enumerate through that whole list, whatever that song file list was. In this case, what I do with them is I print them out. And then later what I do is I ask for user input on one of those index numbers, and then I'll print that number. This is just a placeholder for actually playing a file. So here you can see I've started up the feather, and I'm going to go ahead and restart it. What you'll see is it says, okay, songs available. And it goes through and it gives me this enumeration of an index zero, Clay Guys, Bartle Beats, MP3. One, small selective Bartle Beats. Two, Daisy Bartle Beats. And then it says pick a song. So I'll say, uh, how about two? Press enter. And then we can pretend that goes and plays the song there. So this is a really nice way to work through lists, especially really large lists if you want to. And get yourself in a really simple piece of code, the index and the value right out of your list. And so that is one way you can use enumerate in CircuitPython. And that is your CircuitPython Parsec. Hey, it's me, I'm back. Uh, so, Let's see, I just got one suggestion, thank you, from a Discord member called Is This Discord? I'd love a circuit, Python Parsec episode on LoRa and NeoPixels and how to uh, best listen for packets, animate some NeoPixel packets. I love that, that's a great one. I'll put one together on that. Um, I haven't done that a long time. Last time I did it, I used the Radiohead library inside of Arduino. 
Uh, so this will be a, a fun learning experience for me. Thanks for that, uh, that bit of input. And I'm going to go ahead and make a little note right now so I don't forget. Uh, we'll put that right there. I have a note. Thank you. Uh, okay, so next up what I wanted to do. Let's do a little bit of a gear report. And this is a, a teaser, so I'm going slightly out of order. Current project is right over there. We'll get to that in a second. But an upcoming project that Lady Ada suggested the other day to me and Liz and Jepler was to uh, get together, put our, our minds together, and create a small sequencer synthesizer using SynthIO and CircuitPython and a small display and some, some uh, buttons that is similar to a really wonderful, venerable music making uh, piece of software for the Game Boy originally that's called Nanoloop. Uh, so if you're, if you're familiar with Nanoloop, we're going to try to do a, a real nice, neat, simplified version sim similar to the Nanoloop 1.0. Uh, but what is this thing? Well, it's actually originally a cartridge. So let me go to an overhead view here real quick, and I'll show you the cartridge, and then I'll do a little quick demo of it. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to go ahead and focus this. Uh, so there you can see, uh, thanks by the way to my friend Tim who lent me a Nano Loop cartridge because they're really hard to get now. This came around 1999, 2000 originally. Uh, and it ran on the original Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Pocket. Uh, I'm going to zoom out a bit so you can see some of the interaction as well as the screen here. Um, and, but before I turn that on and, and talk about it, so this is a, originally a piece of software that was uh, created as a Game Boy cartridge which could access the onboard um, sound making capabilities of the Game Boy. Later there were versions that included uh, synth circuitry right on board. I actually have uh, one of those right here in my little Game Boy Color. Uh, this one was called, I think, the Nanoloop Mono. Uh, this one is amazing. Not uh, in the, the least because where the heck is this, the circuitry? It's actually sandwiched in there. It's a, it's a sort of a sandwiched um, PCB construction, which is really wild. You can see a bunch of vias and probably test points, but uh, all of the actual circuits are in the inside there, and it fits right into uh, the Game Boy slot connector there. But I'm going to focus on this one because, yeah, this one is, uh, in its original incarnation, a three-channel uh, or three-voice sequencer so it can access the noise. There was a noise making channel on the Game Boy. Uh, the wavetable synth, and I can't remember what the, the third one is. It's also a, a pitched um, synth, and I, and I honestly can't remember. Oh, it's a square wave. Um, later versions expanded this. You can uh, play very modern versions either on the analog pocket, which is an FPGA um, Game Boy-like handheld, or you can get it for, I think it's a few dollars, maybe eight dollars, maybe less on iOS and Android devices. Those are much more sophisticated than, than this one, but the basic premise is the same. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you a little demo. I'm not an expert in this. Um, I will run out of batteries right then and there, maybe. Let's see. Yep, good. I anticipated this and <laughs> brought some extras. Hopefully that wasn't just the... Uh, the death of my Game Boy. Let's, uh, oh, where did I put these batteries? Uh-oh. I swear I brought a whole thing of batteries in here and now I have lied to you. Um, let's see if these rechargeables work. Let's cross our fingers. If not, we might have to do this another day. Oh wow, it's absolutely, utterly... Hello? All right, I can do a demo on this. Uh, I'll pull the cartridge and put it in this Game Boy Color, which I think still has some power. And I have this plugged into a little amplified speaker set. Uh, 
the reason I wanted to use that other one is I, you may have seen briefly there, I put a backlit screen in it, which makes it easier to see um, than these original reflective screens. But uh, yeah, you can, you can see that fairly well. I'm gonna boost the brightness here, or the exposure. Okay, uh, so there you go, it says Nano Loop. I'll hit start, Oliver Wichow or Wichow, Wichow uh, created it. So to start with, there's one note. Uh, you can kind of hear it there. Let me know how these levels are between me and uh, the, the sound you're hearing. Uh, I'll go ahead and take out that note. Okay, uh, so here there's nothing, nothing playing. You can see, uh, I'm gonna, I think, zoom in just a bit more. That's probably as good as I'll get it, okay. Uh, so if you look in the bottom left there, the three channels I have are that um, R, N, and S. So S, I think, is the square wave. R, I think, is the wave table, and N is noise. Uh, so if we just want to lay in, you can see there's this 16-box uh, pattern that it's running through. Uh, and if I want to lay in a sound for, let's say, a drum, I'll go ahead and uh, start laying in notes. Or in, in the case of the noise, it's not even really a note. It's more of an envelope. And I can... Go ahead and change some of the character of that. Okay, so that's, let's just say that's our simple uh, initial set of uh, sounds. I can go ahead and copy and paste those around. So I'll go ahead and paste. And I don't like the, actually I want to copy this one. I don't like the way that first one sounds. Which one do I like? This one. Okay, so let's say that's our drum pattern. Really simple. Uh, now I'll go into this uh, synth sound, synth voice. And I'll put in some actual notes. Oh. And if I want to mute one of those while I'm, I'm laying stuff in, we can do that. Actually, I'll just put these on these sort of syncopated. And I can drop the octave here. Cut that one. All right, love that. And now I'll go into the third channel here. And I'm gonna raise these up to a more lead Okay, so you can see we've just got uh, some real basic parameters laid in. Sound is really low. Okay. I'm gonna crank that. That's as loud as that's actually gonna go, I think, unless I can. Uh, now I can just change some of the other parameters of how this sounds, so I'll go and pick some effects. And one of the cool things you can do here uh, is 
save these patterns and then recall uh, different patterns and you can string that together to be a song. So what I'll do is head up to this file menu up at the top and I'm gonna save these patterns. I'll come way over here to about D. Okay, and so those are the three that are playing right now, but I can load other ones. So let's load a different... Uh... Let's load a different drum, too. And now I'll go back to my E there and reload those. Oh, wait, I was D. Uh, tell me in the chat how that sound is. Hopefully you can hear that a little better. Uh, and you can see here, this is the song mode. Uh, so here, basically those different patterns have been laid out. There are actually four banks, I think, four banks of 16. Uh, you can pick from one bank and then string that together into song stuff. Um, so, I think I'll end that there. Just shut it off, I can't remember how to stop that. <laughs> um, so that is uh, a really popular uh, early form of Game Boy sequencer that's a lot of fun to play with. You, you can see there the interface really makes the most out of having a, a, a pretty limited bit of space to work with. Um, and, uh, oh, thanks, uh, Jason and Dave let me know the sound was, was, uh, was pretty good there. Um, I should have run it through, sorry, I should have run it into my, um, into my actual mixing board here, but I did not. Um, so, the things that are really interesting about that is that it's a pretty easy to learn interface that um, makes use of a few basic concepts that you repeat all over the place. Uh, the interactions are kind of the same. Uh, you, you really can use two buttons and a D-pad. I think the more modern version on the analog pocket also makes use of uh, some shoulder buttons that are on that one that are, that are not on a traditional um, uh, Game Boy. Uh, there was also a Game Boy Advance version of this. Unfortunately, the cartridges, not many were made. They're all sold out at the moment. I think parts shortage. I don't know what chips are on them. Uh, but if you go to Nanoloop, just, just, I think it might be nanoloop.com, just Google Nanoloop. Um, there was also, also a, uh, actually, let me, let me go to my browser here. Let me pull that up first. Hold on. Uh, I'll show you what the heck I'm talking about, because that's helpful, right? Uh, so, this is nanoloop.com. Uh, if you look at, under Game Boy... Uh, that's similar to, not the same as the one that, that I've got here. I think that I, I have Nanoloop Mono uh, that Tim lent me. That's this one here. Uh, so these are these modern ones. Um, there's a physical device you could, could get. It's hard to find right now also, but this is the same uh, sort of engine. Uh, it does FM synthesis on a handheld with no screen, which is kind of wild kind of like the screen, but that, that's a, a neat um, uh, restriction there. Here is uh, the Nanoloop sequencer for Game Boy Advance, which will also work in like a DS or a DSi or DS Lite, I think. Um, any of the ones that have a GBA slot in the bottom. And then Android and iOS, uh, go check these out if you're interested in this stuff. There's just some, some samples on here. Uh, for some reason, the navigation on this site makes it difficult for me to find the manuals, so I kind of end up Googling uh, manual, and then you'll find some nice PDFs and there are YouTube videos out there. Um, so that's what Nanoloop is, and uh, originally, uh, Lamore said, hey, maybe we, we should do a Nanoloop style thing with uh, Synth.io, and I said, that sounds great. Let me also, uh, Liz and I both wanted to check out, um, compare that to LSDJ, Little Sound DJ, which is another really popular um, uh, 
synth sequencer for Game Boy and other devices that is more of a tracker style. So someone mentioned um, mod tracker and other trackers for the Commodore 64. Uh, I like trackers, but their interface is way more uh, out there for people to get used to versus this one, which is really clear. I also think this one might be easier to code. Uh, trackers tend to have a lot changing on screen, and if we're going to do this on um, a circuit Python screen, we kind of want to minimize the amount of refreshing we're doing. So you can see not a lot is refreshing on that screen, just like one little dot a lot of the time. Um, Bomb Inventions, yeah, uh, LSDJ is awesome too, for sure. Uh, these are all really fun programs. Uh, great to just throw headphones on and, and, you know, if you're getting on a train or an airplane or just sitting on your couch, they're, they're really a lot of fun. Uh, and with the exception of worrying about batteries dying on you, you can uh, get a lot of uh, mileage out of them. But yeah, check it on your phone if you're interested. So uh, that's a preview. No promises, but that's a preview. Uh, we have in Synth.io, some incredible polyphony. Um, we're not really limited to like three or four tracks, which is what you find in NanoSynth. Um, but it might be nice. It might be nice to uh, creatively limit yourself to design or pick some presets for some synth voices uh, and then stick with those uh, as you construct your song. Um, you can always save patterns and put different sounds into them, but it's kind of a nice limitation to not have 16 different sounds happening at once. Uh, kind of focuses it. Uh, so that's Nanoloop and, and, uh, and hopefully a, a little bit of a preview of things to come. So uh, let's see. Oh, uh, C. Grover said maybe use that uh, rotary encoder wheel as a, as a piece of UI uh, interface. That could be cool. Um, gives you a little, little extra extra modification there because those click, I think those click in the, in the um, cardinal directions, center click as well as the, the wheel, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. Maybe I'm wrong. All right, so moving along, uh, let's talk about our good friend, the, uh, the that thing right there, the computer perfection. So I'm going to, before I head over there to the workbench, I want to open up a couple of links uh, to show you how, speaking of Cedar Grover, uh, Cedar Grove saved the day for me on this project because I asked last week, I think it was, hey, how am I going to actually wire this thing? Um, I had shown you, uh, oops, hold on one second. Why is that not? Why is that not opening? Oh, because there's a bullet point. There's an asterisk at the beginning of my URL. That won't work. Hold on. I also disabled key repeat on this keyboard in software at some point, and I can't remember why, so it's very slow going to... Okay. So um, I had a big pile of wires coming out of the center of the computer perfection. I don't have a picture of that I can easily show you right now, but... Uh, this, this circuit board on the computer perfection was, um, a mess of wires where I had pulled the microcontroller out. Uh, so I was thinking about, oops, maybe desoldering the dip connector that I had just shoved my, uh, interconnect cables into and then solder wires to the bottom and Cedar Grove, our good friend suggested, suggested one of these things which is an IDC ribbon cable type of connector, including the little spiky, um, uh, they're not called crimps, but it's, it's kind of like you find on a, a, a telephone um, switch panel. Uh, someone remind me what those are called. Does it say on here? I don't think it does. But uh, it gives you the footprint of a, an IC that goes into a dip socket, except the thing is, let me see what pictures they've got here. A, uh, a connector. You can see it right there. That looks an awful lot like a ribbon connector IDC cable end. Um, and they refuse to show you inside of it. So I'll show you with the, with the top off of one. Let me uh, switch cameras here again. So I got a couple of types of these right here. Uh, and you can see what you get. The idea is to, 
oops, is to pry this off somehow. These are not the ones I used, so I'm not familiar with where the clips are on this. Uh, are they meant to come fully off? Oh, look, I broke one. This was the cheap one, so that's okay. Um, so maybe on this one it doesn't come off, but you are meant to just feed your ribbon uh, cable into there and then squish it down uh, unceremoniously. And then you have uh, a set of, in this case, 28 wires that you can have coming out of this, which are able to just plonk down inside of the, um, the socket. So I'll, I'll show you the one I ended up using was this fancier German one. These cost like $6 each or something like that. They're not cheap, but uh, they saved the day for my wiring. Yeah, $6.69 for this one. Um, so this comes as two parts. And top is just kind of a lid and some channels uh, there for the wires to fit through. And there you can see that we have these little, give you a black background, we have these little um, crimp connectors, I'm going to call them. They're not that, but you just set your wire down, uh, push them down. There are specific tools for doing this. I actually, uh, again, on, on Cedar Grove's suggestion, I think it was because of the limited space I had, I, I used a bunch of this, I think it's 30 gauge, uh, silicon, uh, sheathed insulated wire. This is stranded wire. This is stuff we sell uh, in the store. So with these, you can, you can see I'll do one right now. Uh, you can zoom in a bit. Uh, you can simply push it down just like that with your fingers or uh, I used a little pair of tweezers and then cut the, the excess here off. But that is now uh, touching the metal here. These, I actually found these are a little on the thin side. There is a danger that they might uh, uh, wiggle free. This uh, top isn't really putting pressure on the wire because it's a little skinny. So maybe going to 28 or 26 gauge would be better. It probably uh, indicates what gauge wire you're supposed to use um, in, the, in the data sheet. Um, maybe it says here on DigiKey. It doesn't. Yeah, so probably on the data sheet. Uh, but if you match things up right, this gives you a really convenient way to do uh, essentially breakout wiring for some IC that you have pulled from a socket, which is exactly the situation I found myself in. Uh, this thing is not uh, keyed or anything. You can put this in in any direction. So I actually put a little tape in here and marked uh, where my dot was so that I wired things correctly. And then the lid does. So the lid will show you this little arrow for your zero index or one index, whichever it is. I think zero index uh, pin. So plonk that down and now you'll just uh, put that into where the dot uh, location is on your original socket. So let's go and, and have a look at uh, the end result of that because I've uh, got it put together and I am, I took some photos and I'm going to be starting to include this uh, in a guide. And one second to load up my Discord here so I can see what's going on. Ooh, I'm noticing that monitor that I look at to see what the camera sees is starting to fail. The top third of it is dimming a bunch. <laughs> things, things eventually uh, break here. Let's, uh, let's see. Let me jump in my broadcast chat. Uh, oh, and thank you, someone, uh, you can see it right there, DJ Devin 3 posted one of these punch downs, that's the word, thank you, yeah, punch down, uh, very similar to that punch down uh, tool for teleco stuff, maybe, I don't know, this one looks teleco sized, but yeah, there's probably, probably ones for this uh, use case. And I'm also just going to tell my phone display to not turn off, so I can uh, see... The Discord. Where is that in? Energy? Display? Mm, auto lock five minutes. Yeah, never. Okay. Great. Uh, Andy Calloway said, yeah, I realized I have one. So perfect. Okay, so here is the computer perfection. And um, here is my schematic I made, uh, which I had 
sorry, that's hard to see. I had uh, worked with as I figured out which uh, buttons on the uh, computer perfection were uh, essentially linked to which leg of this IC um, and where I had put them on the Metro M7. Uh, so this helped me go through and do my wiring so that I could say, okay, this is note zero, note 9876, the score button. Uh, put those into my little IDC uh, ribbon guy and then run them to a uh, proto wing shield that I'm plugging into uh, my top of my Metro M7. So using that gets us to here and, and we'll, um, we'll come back. Hopefully uh, this will still work after I open it up and I can come back and, and show you a little demo uh, of things. But I'll, I'll uh, live dangerously and I'm going to go ahead and uh, you might remember if you've been with me since the beginning of this computer perfection saga, one of the beautiful things about this is how easy it is to get into the, the device. Two screws and then the whole thing pivots on this hinge. And I'm going to go ahead and unplug my USB cable, which will allow me to pull this out a little bit better. And... You can see here I've got proto wing shield, which I'm using in lieu of a proto board because I didn't have one. I'm not actually using any of the screw terminal uh, features of that. Uh, and full disclosure, I get a small um, bit of money when we sell one of these because Todd and our friend Brian and I uh, made these and we get a little royalty from Adafruit when they sell these. So uh, I just want to let you know that since I'm showing it off. Okay, so here is my I2S amplifier. I've got that plugged into also the little proto area on the wing shield here. And I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in a bit. So that's running through a little hole that, that existed in uh, the toy originally to run the battery uh, cables to the two nine volts that were under here. I've got empty space there and this nice enclosed speaker uh, right now. And I'll probably come up with a nicer solution for the USB cable. Uh, so that now what that does though, is it allows me to uh, unscrew the board from the plastic toy. It's just one piece. And then we can take a closer look at how this is put together. My original idea until C Cedar Grove maker had his um, suggestion was I was going to end up desoldering these this socket and then running wires straight out the bottom of this uh, which I hate so I'm so glad you saved me from that fate that would have been a mess and uh, less reversible it's actually fairly reversible not that the original game is all that good to be honest I think the the design of the visual design of the thing is better industrial design is better than the actual game so I'm not likely to ever Put this back. They're also not priceless. Uh, you can get these for forty dollars, roughly, on eBay a lot of the time. And that just pulls out of there like that. You can see there was originally a piezo speaker, which I disconnected, um, and I'm not going to use. There's these little stems, which will fall out when I set this down. So I'm taking that out. These are just extenders for uh, the two center buttons there. And now you can get a better look at what we've done. So you'll see there's a pair of wires hanging off of here. Uh, those originally were used to power on the device with a little hinge switch. I may see, I can't remember how those are connected to the circuit board. If I can read those like a pin or rewire it to read those like a pin, I may use that for turning this thing on and off, which would be cool. Um, but you can see uh, we have our 10 switches that play uh, the LED game originally, but now are playing notes. And then we have the two switches here and here, which are used for um, modifications to the synth. And then we have a, a set of three switches here. I'm only using two of them, and that's because this one here, it's kind of a matrix and I'm not using it that way. And so if I touch this one, it, it disconnects some grounds for some of the switches or something. It kind of goes haywire. So. Uh, ignoring that one, but I'm able to use these two switches. So 
there you can see my uh, my little punch down connected IC connector thing and all of these uh, very thin wires that I have running and bundled off to the side so that my um, microcontroller can can use all of those and those are running to the same place that I had them on the uh, the Metro originally. Uh, it's just going through this Permaproto now. Um, and this here can be, I'm not going to remove it because I don't want the, the legs to, uh, or the spring socket that they're going into to move that much at this point, but that essentially lifts off of here. Uh, and if I didn't have this tape holding the little wire bundle down, uh, it would be a little easier to demonstrate that. So uh, let's see, with it in this state, actually, we can demonstrate it. I'll, uh, or should we, yeah, let me, let me, let me demonstrate it in this state and then we'll put it fully back together. So what I'll do is take my speaker wire out of here. There's only one way to get that out. It's a bit of a puzzle. Oh, that doesn't want to come out at all now. Maybe I fed it through the other way. I'll leave that connected, actually. Um, so this will be semi-awkward, but not too bad, I think. So there, you know, you should be able to see just the amplifier getting connected here. And then I'll plug this into the Metro M7, like so. Let me zoom out just a bit. And then I'll give power. I uh, just got a little battery pack here. Okay, so with that powered up, we should hear Okay, so I have it working uh, polyphonically. It can play multiple notes at once. I don't even think there's a limit. I think I can play all 10 of these at once. It just sounds like chaos. Uh, you can also hear I have a sustain going. So when I press a note, it'll just stay playing, add a note to it. And then I have a momentary button. That's this green button here. When I press that, it just uh, releases them like the pedal on a piano, releases the sustain. Uh, I can turn that feature off entirely with this switch here. All right, so they'll, they'll stop on their own. You'll also hear I have a really long release. Remember, uh, Jeff wrote this really excellent ADSR, Attack Decay Sustain Release envelope, which is the on-off, but with style. Uh, so we ramp really gently for about almost three seconds whenever I play a note, because I want this to be uh, sort of this ambient sci-fi machine. So we want real, it's not a reverb, but it's, it's got that feel of something that extends long enough to have some, some panache. Uh, and then I can also uh, play an extra note that's an octave below the note I press by holding this uh, second, it's this one here, the second one. So this is what this little red uh, switch is plugged into. So when I press that, uh, here I'll go without. So I'm gonna pick a higher note. Okay, so if you hear that, and hopefully you can hear, by the way, hopefully this little speaker uh, and my, my mic picks it up well enough. If it's terrible, let me know and I'll, I'll set my mic over there. So here's the note on its own. And now I'm gonna add the octave. And without. which is kind of nice. Uh, really easy to reconfigure what things do. This is in CircuitPython. Uh, I just have something that when this is pressed down, any note that gets played, comma, that same note minus 12, which is uh, since this is uh, currently configured to 
take in MIDI note numbers and then convert them to the frequency to play. Uh, it's really nice easy math to work with because there's one MIDI note per semitone, so you can just do minus 12 and you've just dropped an octave. Uh, you could do little chords, triads, all with really easy math in there. Uh, so that's it. Those are the features right now. Let me go ahead and reassemble this. And then uh, I'll do a little demo with it in the cool case. And then we can talk about some, uh, some planned features that I have. So let's see. I think the easiest thing to do is I'm going to go ahead and reconnect. Zoom back out. Our dog's going crazy outside. Uh, I'll go ahead and reconnect this. So by the way, in case you're curious, this blue ring, it's a single um, piece of plastic with uh, enough flex in it to do these sort of living hinge style buttons. So that's, that's all that happens for the 10 outside buttons. And then the, the little stems poke through here for these two middle ones. Um, and I do need to keep that wire out of the way there. I may add a little more tape because I don't want that getting pinched under here. Ooh, arpeggiator with circular lights, please, says DJ Devin 3 Oh, I'm glad you said that, by the way, because that gets me to another point. These LEDs are really impossible to use in situ, in this circuit. Um, the way it worked originally, it was super clever. The 4-bit microcontroller was essentially uh, multiplexing uh, input and output over the same pin. So all these pins that I'm using to uh, read button inputs need to flip state to light up an LED and then flip the state back to be an input. So input, output, input, output. I don't want to deal with that at all. Uh, so the options are cut some traces and run these uh, to a multiplexing, um, like a PWM board output over I squared C, or ignore them entirely and feed some NeoPixels into here, which may be what I try Next, I've got um, some candidates here. There's this really, really thin NeoPixel strip, which maybe could just uh, live right there and not disturb anything. There's so much space in this. This is what I like about older toys. The, there's just a lot of work, a lot of room to work with. Um, so something like that fed in there could give me some, some cool effects. I've also got some edge lit NeoPixels that uh, are the sort of side angle ones, um, or maybe put some, some jewel ones on the board. Something like that could happen. Uh, yeah, Blitz City says, definitely NeoPixels. All right, yeah, we're going to ignore it. Sorry, red LEDs. I know you were a staple of 1970s toys, and I love you, and the, the red LED and the nose of the X-Wing fighter was my first LED love, but uh, we've, got, uh, we've got more modern solutions now. So, Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and reconnect this PCB. Uh, if you didn't see some of the other episodes where I talked about this, uh, Phil Tyrone last night on Ask an Engineer showed in the retro tech segment, uh, he got one of these, he showed it off. He's the one who introduced me to this. I, I had never seen or heard of this thing. Uh, he showed it off, showed some examples of the, um, kind of dome head commercial that, uh, was aired on TV as well as a cameo it played in an episode of Buck Rogers. And there was also a movie Ice Pirates where the set designers grabbed one of these and just threw it, threw it on the set because it looked cool. Um, and it was designed by Ralph Baer, who's considered by many to be the father of video games. He, uh, created a billion different electronic toys, including, uh, the Magnavox Odyssey, uh, and some other Pong-like home video games. So, uh, big ups to Ralph. Um, so, let's see. I've got board plugged back in. Uh, I've got my audio amplifier here running to my little speaker that's on the bottom. Uh, for now, I just have this unceremoniously living in here. I don't have any uh, mounting method. I may do something. There's enough space to, to maybe piggyback off of one of these screws um, or something like that. A couple of these screws, printed bracket, some foam, who knows. But uh, 
one of those, one of those methods. Uh, and for now, I will have, um, I'm just gonna push this USB cable up here for power. Could probably do um, any of a number of different methods, including run nine volt battery and, and plug it into this uh, DC jack on the Metro M7. Uh, that would be kind of period appropriate to this, this regulator on the uh, Metro can handle, I think up to 12 volts. And I'm gonna unplug that from power while I'm futzing around in here. And I'll go ahead and, oh, I almost forgot. Oh, I did forget. All right, we'll have to use these upside down. I forgot uh, to feed those in. Did, did anyone notice? <laughs> Thin man, thank you, you left a few parts. All right, I'll correct that later. Um, for now, we'll use it like, like that. Uh, I will put these two screws in because without them, any of the upper arc uh, notes you press will rotate the whole lid, uh, whole face of it back in. <laughs> Thin man, thank you for catching that. I, I just wasn't paying attention. Okay, those should still work. So here we go. Uh, I've got power. Again, it'll be nice with some NeoPixels uh, so we can see what's happening. I may try to st stay sane and keep them red. I don't think many colors are gonna show through anything other than red given this red uh, translucent plastic. Okay, so here I'm gonna go into sustain mode. Okay, we can stop the sustain with that set button there. The, sorry about the focus there. The mode button here gives us a choice of uh, voices. So I have two wave shapes Okay, so that one is almost like a sine wave, a triangle. It's got not a ton of harmonics. Um, even while it's playing, I can go ahead and switch the waveform. And you can hear that one has a, a, a much greater set of harmonics, more like a sawtooth or even spikier, so it gets a lot of upper uh, upper frequency stuff that you hear in there. And if I turn off the sustain switch here, Sort of sci-fi ambient uh, music, right? Uh, it's a lot of fun to play with. Very simple. Um, definitely creaky, just because the original toy had a lot of creaky plastic situation going on. Uh, but I like it, it's a lot of fun, and the sound is surprisingly loud for that little amplifier and this little speaker. Um, I'll put it a little closer to me. Really fun to play around with. Um, so let's talk about changes to it. Um, Jepler has added a few things to the current build uh, for SynthIO that are really cool. Actually, there's, there's three things that I, that I may be looking at adding. Uh, one is a um, LFO, low frequency oscillator. I talked about those, I think, last week. So low frequency oscillator is just a sub audible frequency, slow moving wave of some kind. It could be any wave shape you want. Very often you use something like a sine wave or a triangle wave. Why we want that even though we can't hear it is because we can use it to modulate other things. So for example, if I just switch my frequency or my rather my, uh, my wave shape back and forth, let me turn sustain back on.
right? So that's the same note, uh, but I'm changing that um, wave shape. If I want, instead of me doing that by hand, let's say once every second, if I want that to gently change or be real fast however I want, uh, we can do that with an LFO. We can point the LFO at the uh, volume of the notes. You can do things like a tremolo, right, which is just the um, audio level going in and out. We could do it uh, for something like a vibrato, which would be the pitch going up and down. Um, so the LFO is a really cool feature, and I think that's going to help with some of that um, sci-fi vibe. Another thing I'll probably do is slightly detune my octave so that we get um, some beating of the frequencies as they go in and out of phase. Uh, and then uh, another thing that Jepler's adding is math blocks. So these are going to be little modular units in the code that can do things like add together two waveforms. Um, it, it's a, a sort of a utility that will allow us to do interesting modular uh, synth patching inside of code. Uh, and then the third thing is um, uh, ring modulation. So ring modulation is a way of um, creating some really interesting sounds using a audible wave and a carrier wave, uh, and they interact. So it's essentially two waves um, working together to make some new sound. Really good for sci-fi stuff. It's not always musical. Uh, it'll kind of throw your scales way out of whack, but for a sci-fi thing, it could be cool to wave in and out of some ring modulation. Uh, it's very uh, ringing. It's what the Dalek voice was, uh, was done with and some other notable sci-fi things. So. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's where the computer perfection is right now. Thing of beauty, and now it's starting to sound pretty cool. So um, thanks for coming along on the ride with me on this. And if you want to go grab one, head over to eBay because you should still be able to find these uh, every once in a while for not too much money. I think they made a ton of these. Uh, and yeah, big thank you to Jepler, to Mark Gambler, to Toddbot, all uh, people who've been helping me with uh, aspects of the code and SynthIO and, and making this whole thing work, and to Seagrover for, uh, for the hardware help. So it takes a village, and I appreciate it very much. All right, uh, what do we think? Is that it? Let me look at some questions here over in our chats. Uh, first of all, I'm going to look at my YouTube chat. Um, Bomb Inventions said that they, oh, they found a tracker software, going back to the audio sequencing, a tracker software that worked on a Texas instrument calculator like the TA-82. <laughs> That's awesome. Real serious chiptune making machine. I love it. Uh, i have to check that out. That's cool. Um, let's see. A bomb inventions also says you can use a vice and a piece of wood to crimp those those kinds of things. Any IDC things, that's great. Like without an arbor press, you can just give it uh, even pressure, which is super helpful. Bomb inventions, you were trying to help me to not forget the buttons too. <laughs> Thank you for your your attention to detail. I absolutely missed those. First time too. I kept putting them in properly as I went in and out of this thing. You said it. Yes, you're allowed to say it. You said it. Uh, yes, yeah, sim similar to frequency modulation. I don't know. I, I mean, I've used ring mod, and I don't know how it differs. Uh, it probably is a form of frequency modulation, and it was often do done with a diode ring. So this, it's, I think it's a specific kind of uh, frequency modulation. I think you're right. Uh, and what's going on over here in Discord? Any other thoughts, questions? Um, oh, DJ Devin learned recently about using PWM synthesizers. That's another great place to use our LFO. So pulse width modulation, you can take a regular square wave, which is an even duty cycle of 50% on, 50% off. Uh, as you start to change that proportion on or off, you get cool harmonics in your sound. The pitch is the same, but the harmonics change. Uh, being able to turn a regular wiggly knob on that gives you really cool uh, sounds, and that's another use of the the LFO that we'll, we'll be able to use, low-frequency oscillator. Um, and let's see. I think that's it. Yeah, thank you to everyone working on SynthIO. 
Uh, and I need cool graphics like these for my synth stuff, says Johnny Bergdahl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. Maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll get some stuff going with the DVI uh, Feather RP2040 stuff that is reactive. That would be really nice. Okay, I think I'm going to call it right there. Thanks, everyone, for coming to my workshop today. It's been a lot of fun. It's been fun having you and showing you stuff and a lot of fun getting to, to build these cool things. So I will uh, encourage you to stop by for some of our other live streams. We should be having a deep dive with Tim, Foamy Guy, tomorrow. Uh, we'll be back on probably a desk of Lady Ada on Sunday. That seems to be when those are happening, but there are no promises. Those happen at uh, random hacky, hacker mama times. Uh, I'll be back on Tuesday with a product pick of the week. Wednesday, 3D Hangouts, Show and Tell, uh, Ask an Engineer, how could I forget? And, uh, and then back to this. So thanks everyone. Thanks Gary T. Thanks Bomb Inventions over in the YouTube. I will catch you next week. Uh, thanks everyone over in our Discord and for all of you watching out there who aren't on a chat. Bye bye.